Morning, everybody. Did you know that the single most effective way for you to grow as a Christian person is to read the Bible and talk about it with your friends? That's one of the reasons why I enjoy the kind of teaching that we're doing right now. Not that we're just going through line by line, verse by verse, which I think is healthy and is, is biblical. You know, it makes everybody clear about where we stand and what we believe. But also, it's, it's a way for you to cheat. Now that we're together in the big room talking about it, you're going to grow here today. And then you're going to have something to talk about in the car afterwards. You're going to grow even more again and again and again. You're going to watch little snippets on Facebook. And you might actually be a real Christian one day. Isn't that exciting? I think that's pretty cool. So let's get into it. Here we are. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, and we're going to go. Finally, all of you be of one mind. I like that he says first that it's, he says finally, and it's only in the middle of the letter. I think that's, that's probably how I preach. You know, <laughs> my last point. 16 minutes before I'm done. But he, but he says, be of one mind. And the Greek term there, I thought, just out of curiosity, I thought I'm going to go ahead and, and look it up and find out what it literally means, you know, because sometimes things get lost in translation. And, and, and so it's a, a combination word. But, but if you were to translate it literally, it means be of one belly, which I think is spectacular. I don't know why they changed that at all. It means be of one midriff. It means because back then they, they understood that the, the, the mind, the part of you that made you you, the thing that was uniquely yours, your, your, your will, your determination, your preferences, your aesthetic, I mean, the, the thing that's you was really in your gut. And we, we talk about that sometimes. When we say, oh, I feel it in my gut. Or, I'm going to trust my gut instinct. That's what we're saying. Be of one gut meaning care about the same things, have the same priorities, the same passions, the same enthusiasms. And, of course, the only way we're going to be of one gut is if we decide which gut we're going to follow. And we're not following Dave. We're not, we're not following Kelly. You know, we're not following Ben. We're, we're following Jesus, which means in order for us to be unified, to be of one mind, to be of one belly, we got to have the gut of Christ. we got to figure out what things Jesus cares about, what things God's spirit is already sponsoring and moving in our world. We've we got to get on the page with the Lord and let him not only guide us as individuals, but let him guide our, our whole church. Let him guide our church families. Was that too much preaching too quick? Because I got really excited about that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I have a few tricks up my very short sleeve today, all of which are in service to distraction. I have to distract you. And I have to distract me from my face because I can't handle this baby face, clean-shaven thing. I don't know how you guys do it. I look at myself in the mirror. I want to punch myself in the head. It's awful. So I put on some nice clothes, and we're going to talk really fast about the Bible, and I'm going to grow. I'm going to plug my nose and blow in hopes that the whiskers come out faster because i, I got to get my beard back. This is terrible. All right. Be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Love like brothers. Love like sisters. Now, of course, in this translation, we're, we're using gender-inclusive language, but the, the idea is, is brotherly love. This is the defining feature of Christian community, brotherly love, sisterly love. And i got to tell you, um, Christians, when, we, when, we're, when we're actually following Jesus and being of one mind and we're rubbing shoulders together, man, Christians, when we're, when we're just being Christians, are really great at this. I mean, it happens naturally, intuitively. Because we know what brotherly love is supposed to be like, right? You, when, you, when you love somebody like a brother, you, you might tease them a little bit. You're going to spend time with them. You're going to laugh with them. You're going to have jokes that only you understand and they understand, things that you share. You know, Ben and I, we're really close. We've traveled the world together. We share hotel rooms together. We have all kinds of stupid things that we do to each other. Most of the time when we're traveling, we're laughing, you know, and then we have to pretend that we were spending time in prayer and instead we were just horsing around, you know. I mean, that's, we, got, we got a good brotherly love going on. But brothers also, well, brothers also fight. You know, I will fight for Ben. I'll fight to protect him. I will fight for opportunities for him because he's my brother. He, he does the same for me. Nobody protects me like he does. And, and that's because we love each other. But we'll also fight each other because that's what brothers do. I mean, if you've got two little boys in your house, you know at some point they're going to be in fisticuffs in the backyard. And that's just boys being boys, you know. Um, but you, you, you fight. I think where this all breaks down, though, is when in the church we have these brotherly privileges without 
brotherly love. So a lot of times you get people in, in church and they got, well, they got some stuff they want to fight about. Or maybe it's the way, you know, maybe it's internal church stuff, you know, how, how things go on a Sunday or what programs we have or whatever. They, they, want, they want to fight about that. Um, but that's, that's not the behavior of a brother. That's the behavior of a shareholder, the behavior of a customer. Um, and you can tell because, because when we start acting that way, and we're all prone to this sometimes, you know, we start, we start thinking about what we're offering. Well, I give a lot of money. Well, I, I invest a lot of time here. Well, you know, I, I've been going to this church for two and a half decades. And, w- and we have this entitlement. Now, again, if we're honest, all of us get this way. I get this way. So we don't want to just pick on, you know, crummy church people out there. What we want to do is evaluate our own hearts, our own spirits, and say, Lord, am I bought in like a brother? Or am I entitled, making demands, making threats? Um, and we had somebody earlier this year, this was so, you know how you kind of blurt something out, and then as you do, you realize, oh, yeah, that's the truest thing I've ever said in my entire life, you know? And they were mad about something at Westman's. I don't remember what it was. And they said, well, don't, if this doesn't change, I'm going to leave. And I blurted out, you think I want you to stay? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't want you here. Get lost. You know, I mean, my responsibility to the Lord is to shepherd you if you're part of our church, and I'll do my best to do that. But if you're threatening to leave, then whew, this is a win-win. <laughs> no, you, you, and we know we all get it in our hearts like that sometimes where we think, man, I, this thing's got to be done. Hey, you know what? I, I, think you can, I think you can fight for the things that you want. You can fight for the things that matter to you. When? When? You're fighting with your brothers. At the end of the day, you know, we're, we're still the same family. I will fight you. I will fight for you. I will fight with you. You'll do the same for me. That, that's how West Winds is a church. That's how the kingdom of God functions. You don't have to give up your passions. You just have to submit your passions to one another as we come together in the mind of Christ as one body. And... Uh, I, I could preach more about that because that's important, but you, you look bored, so we'll keep going. All right. Be tenderhearted and courteous. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate. Instead, bless those who insult you. Bless those who insult you. Bless those who insult you. And, you know, sometimes the clear teaching of Scripture is really helpful, you know, useful. It's to say, don't be drunk with wine, be drunk with the Holy Spirit. You go, oh, great, I, I understand what that means. It means I ought to cut myself off at the bar, or if I go to a party and I get carried away, I mean, it's really, don't get drunk. Okay, I got it, high five. But then you get something like this. Bless those who insult you, and you think, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that really applies. No, oh, it, it, it applies. It, it, it's so, it, this is so hard. This is so hard. Bless those who offend you. Bless those who hurt your feelings. Bless those who have different opinions than you do about important things like finances and and politics and policy. But bless those who see you as their enemy. Bless those that are your enemy. This this is hard to do. I, I struggle to put this into practice. But what I keep reminding myself of is, is why I'm here and what I'm for. You know, the, the Lord has placed me here. The Lord has placed you here to be emissaries of his goodness. Ambassadors, we're called. Living letters, living epistles that Christ's own words are written on our heart. We're supposed to be like the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of God's grace and salvation to the people around us. And so when I'm mad, which happens, I know it's hard to believe but it's a leap year, and I'm planning to get angry once. And when I'm mad, that, that's the thing i got to remember. Is regardless of what they're doing to me, regardless of the hardship and the frustration they're causing me, I'm here to bless. To bless. This is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you strength to do so, and then reward you for being faithful. God always, I like this note here, God always provides sufficient strength to pursue holy purpose. 
Look, God is asking you to change. He's asking you to do something different with your life, to do something more with your life. That's not to say that what you're doing is somehow, you know, bad or wrong. It's just to say that there's more. There's more. And when you look forward over the next year, two years, five years, and you, you say, God, what, what are you trying to birth in me? What are you trying to grow in me? I guarantee you it's more. More nobility, more largesse, more generosity, more courtesy, more love, more kind. It's, it's more. He is amplifying what he has given you with his Holy Spirit. And he's making you strong. And, and this, I think, is the, the, the best vision for, for, for disciples that I can imagine. Is that when you so totally give your life to Jesus and you keep, continue to surrender over and over and over again, you know, your sins, your failings, your shortcomings, when you stop pretending that you don't have them but instead just honestly offer them up to the Lord as, as a sacrifice and God cleanses you and he jams his spirit in you and keeps pumping you up, you know, like an overinflated soccer ball, right? Then you, you're strong. Mature Christians are defined by, by strength and by joy. Now, you might still run into adversity, of course, and of course that feels like it takes you out at the knees. Even strong people kneel. Even strong people walk with a limp. But the vision that God has for you is that you'd be confident, upright, glowing, full of life. God will grant you the strength to do so, to become this person, and then reward you for being faithful. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament. All who would love life and see good days should keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceit. Look, look, look at this right here. All who would love life and see good days. What is the point of living Sometimes we think, well, I am here so that, uh, well, I, I don't know, I guess so that I can save my family. Sometimes we think, well, I'm here just, you know, the, the point of, of knowing Jesus is to, you know, get, get, get Jesus in, you know, go, go, go to heaven when I die, whatever, I mean, you know, to, to be saved and then, and then to live a holy life. Did, did you know that, that, that if we talk about living a holy life, and we emphasize holiness over life, we've actually done a disservice to the teaching in Scripture. What God made you for is, is life. He's the God of life. He's the author of life. What does God do? God makes things live. Romans 4, he calls things that are not as though they are. He gives life to the dead. Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. He looks at this whole valley full of skeleton bones and calls them back to the life. They all get up, dance around, have a party. The whole thing God wants to do in you is help you live. And a lot of times we go, well, I'm alive already, so now I'll just work on, you know, being righteouser. Well, th that's good. But if you really want to get the full teaching of Scripture, then you understand that holiness is a qualifier of life. And your energy ought to be as much into living as it is into holy living. And so you see a Scripture like this, and we think this is a throwaway comment, all who would love life and see good days. We think, well, yeah, that's, that's nice. And basically, he means everybody. No, no, he means you. And I, I love life. Can you remember a time in your life where you felt like that? Maybe it's right now, in which case, fantastic. Maybe you've never felt that way, in which case, let's remind you that that's the goal. You ought to love life. No, don't feel guilty if you don't. Just understand that what God wants for you is that you would have a life that you could enjoy superlatively. And that you would have good days. You know, you get home at the end of the day, you're tired. Somebody asks you, how was your day? I mean, and you're cooked. You're exhausted, right? Sometimes you're exhausted, but you go, today was a good day. A good, I'm, I'm going to bed with nothing left, but today was a good day. Oh, that every day ought to be a good day. A good day like that. How do we get there? We keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. We turn away from evil and do good. That's what repentance means. It literally means 
turning away or turning your mind. The word comes from metanoia. It means get, getting a new head, a new mind. Let's say changing your mind. We might even call it an afterthought or a change of heart. It's, it's, it's when you change. It's when you change. Now, the, the word repentance has a bad rap. Now, now we hear it. We, you know, makes it sound condemnatory, you know. Um, did, you, did we tell you about the guy who came to West Winds? This was so funny. I thought this only happened like on the internet. But some guy came here and was de- describing to his girlfriend in the lobby that we're a non-damnational church. But what he meant was non-denominational, but that's such a word. Nobody even said non-damnational church. And I thought, that's pretty funny. Yeah, I want to be a non-damnational pastor, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, so but, but the, the, we, don't wanna, we don't want anybody to feel like they're being damned or judged or, or condemned. But we do have to understand that the only way you, you progress um, in, the, in the spiritual life, I mean, in the life of your heart, is when you change. You change. I mean, you read the Bible, you talk about it with friends, and you realize there's a gap between what's described there and what you're living in here, and, and so you change. The Spirit of God convicts you about your behaviors on Saturday night or on Tuesday morning, and then you, you go, oh, man, I, I'm having an afterthought. Maybe i got to change. And if you want more for what God has, more of what God has for you, then it's going to require an ongoing change. And that's always one of the big emphases in our, in our teaching here. I mean, if you, were, if you were hypothetically writing an academic treatise on the theology of West Winds, one thing you might note, that was a joke that didn't land. One thing you might note is that, is that when we talk about repentance, we don't, we don't talk about it as a one-time activity, repenting from your sins, believing in Jesus, and going to heaven when you die. We talk about it as an ongoing conversation. Because I, mean, I probably repent 20 times a day. On a good day. Because I just realized there's all these little things that I just, I got to keep giving over to the Lord. Giving over to the Lord. Because that's, that's how we grow. And I, w- I want to be more pleasing. All right. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And God's ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know, we have these uh, paintings that are hung across. This, this week's painting is the one uh, that has kind of a half face on it, which is really fun for us to conceptualize all that and think about it because all the way through the Scripture, um, God is personified. And we know God doesn't look like a, a man. I mean, God is beyond gender. God is beyond, you know, what, what's the term? Anthropoidalism, whatever, whatever the word is. I think I made that up, but it sounds, sounds legit, whatever. Right? But, but all the way through the scripture, they, they personify God as having eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth. And you get the sense that God is, well, he's, he's tasting us. He's savoring us. That God is smelling us. That we're, that we're caught up. That, that God is, has created an environment of people for his pleasure. That he dwells in the midst of us. Like we're a museum for him to just enjoy. And, and that's really the, the, the thing that we're getting to in this scripture is that over and over and over again, man, when you, when you get your heart in line with God's, he enjoys it. And the more he enjoys your life, the more he blesses your life and, and amplifies it so that you get more good days, that you get more good things, that you get more connection with the people around you, that you're filled more with love and love and love. And so these two halves of the same scripture go together. Finally, all of you be of one mind be of one gut, be of one preference, be, be of one belief. And then we go and describe on how we get to be of one through love, being bonded together through repentance. And then in the process of that repentance, as God nestles in among his people, as God recognizes his own divine stamp in each of us, then, then he amplifies what we got, blesses it, courts it. And so we look at all that together and we think, okay, that's, that's our charge then. To be of one mind, to love like brothers, to repent of all the things that divert us away so that every day, more and more and more, we are pleasing God. Amen? Father, thank you for the clarity you give us about how to make you happy about how to bring you pleasure and satisfaction. Thank you that you tell us the things that are really important, the things that really matter to you and to us 
and to our church and to the world through our church. And so we say to you over and over and over again, Lord, we, we want to submit. We want to submit to your spirit. We want to submit to your word. We want to submit to one another so that we are unified in you. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. We're reading the book of 1 Peter all together liturgically, so let's go ahead and do that right now. We'll read together. Be tenderhearted and courteous. We will bless those who insult us. God has called us to repay evil with good. He'll grant us strength to do so and reward us for being faithful. We will be of one mind and have compassion for one another. We'll love like brothers, love like sisters. All who would love life and see good days, let us turn away from evil and do good. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and God's ears are open to our prayers. Amen. 